Welcome everyone to this episode of Pardon My Jargon, one of the series that we are doing here on Tour Today Ministries. Pardon My Jargon has as its focus, as I mentioned in the introductory video, uh, to correct the religious jargon that has found its way into our, our vocabulary and has kind of settled there. And because it's so familiar to us, we often don't take time to re-examine the actual words and jargon that we're using. Now this first episode of Pardon My Jargon is going to be about what I consider to be the church's most misunderstood word. And that word is church, C-H-U-R-C-H. You'd think that people who call themselves the church would certainly understand what the word means. But unfortunately, this is not the case. But I hope that after you finish this teaching on this word, that you'll have greater clarity. And that is what we are aiming for always in this series. This first episode and this first word we're looking at, the word church, is such a, an emotionally loaded term and is such an important one and such a, a big topic that I'm dividing the teaching into two episodes. And we're going to ask three questions in each episode, and we'll tackle the first three here. But before we begin that, let me ask a preliminary question. What does the word church mean to you? You know, the, the word church means so many different things to so many different people. Some think of a church as a building that they go to on a Sunday. And others think, well, no, the church is the body of Messiah. It's the people. Others think it's only the people in my denomination or people who see things my way. And um, so we want to get down to what does the Bible say? What do the scriptures say? And you may be surprised to discover that the word that we translate church is found also in the Hebrew scriptures. In fact, it's found there more than it is in the New Testament scriptures. So let's begin. Our first question we want to ask is, um, what are the biblical words for church? And we're going to find that there are two of them. There are two words. The one that we are most familiar with is, is the word ekklesia, and that's the word on the left, ekklesia. This is the Greek word. It's where we get the word ecclesiastical, um, ecclesiology, ecclesiastes, the book in the Bible. It comes from this word ekklesia, which is found 115 times in the New Testament scriptures. But it has an exact Hebrew equivalent which is the word kahal. These two words mean exactly the same thing. And the word kahal, which is on the right, is found 162 times in the Hebrew scriptures, in the Old Testament. <clears throat> so you may surprise you to find that the word church is, uh, occurs more often in the Old Testament than in the New. And the question is going to come up, which we will address shortly, is then why don't they translate the word kahal as C-H-U-R-C-H? -H? And there's a reason for that. You might be very surprised to find out what that reason is. But let's look at these words a little more closely. Here's the definition of the word ecclesia. It is a convened assembly of the people. Now you recall from the introduction to this series that my contention is, is that there are no religious terms in the Bible. I know that sounds shocking, but as I study the scriptures, both in the Hebrew and the Greek, I have not found any religious jargon, religious terminology, unless you want to call God a religious term. But so many of the things, the words we've taken and put them over here and say, well, these are religious terms, that's not the case when you read the original Hebrew and Greek. And that is the same here with Ecclesia. And I'll show you some examples right from the Bible itself to show that this word is not a religious word. Now, its Hebrew equivalent, kahal, can be used both as a verb and a noun. 
When it's used as a noun, it means an assembly or a congregation. When it's used as a verb, it means to summon, to call together, to congregate, to convene. So uh, this is true of so many Hebrew nouns. They can be used as verbs, and Hebrew verbs can be used as nouns. This happens to a great degree in English as well, but um, in Hebrew, it's just uh, throughout. We find it over and over and over. Now, the word church is unfortunate. What I mean by that is not the concept, it's the word C-H-U-R-C-H that is unfortunate because it's neither a Hebrew word, nor a Greek word, nor an English word. It's a German word. And it was brought over in the Middle Ages sometime from the German, and it doesn't bear any resemblance to its Hebrew and Greek roots. Um, in other languages, we do find an echo of the word ecclesia. For example, in Latin, uh, it's also ecclesia, Spanish, iglesia, and French. I do not know how to pronounce French, but it's something like iglis. An Irish, Scot, and Welsh, you can see how they're spelled, but I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce them. But you can see here, they all have a similarity. You can tell they have the same common root, which is the root Ecclesia. Now, in my Bible, the one I use most of the time is a New American Standard. And at the uh, introductory page to each book of the Bible, it shows the title of the book, and then it shows the name of the book in its original language. Now, here is the title page for Ecclesiastes. And I'm sure you can recognize that in this name, you see the word ecclesia right there. But look over here at the Hebrew, and you'll notice that the word kohal, which is made of the three root letters, kof, he, lamed, make up the name of this book, kohalet. As ecclesia is the root for Ecclesiastes, Kahal is the root for the Hebrew name of this book, which is Kohelet. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how this word ecclesia and the word Kahal are equated in Scripture. Let's take two examples. The first example is Psalm 22:25. And this is how it reads in the English Standard Version. From you comes my praise, referring to God. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. Now we can see here that the word translated congregation in Hebrew is the word kahal. You may be wondering what is that additional letter at the front of the word? The letter bait, when attached to a noun, means in or with. So, kahal is congregation. Bakahal, as we see here, means in the congregation. So, we can see that these two words are equivalent. Now, this third rendering of Psalm 2225, you can see, is in Greek. And you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, Grant. Hebrew, the Hebrew scriptures were written in Hebrew. The Old Testament was not written in Greek, and you're correct. But about 300 B.C., 70 rabbis were called together by um, the head librarian in, um, it was in Egypt, in the city of uh, Alexandria. At that time in the ancient world, Alexandria was like the Outside of Rome and, and Athens, Alexandria and, and Egypt was just the jewel of a city. It was, it was an amazing place, a very international city. And it uh, boasted the largest library in the known world. Now, at that time, there were no printing presses, so everything was written on scrolls, on papyrus, and rolled up. And everything had to be hand-copied. But um, they had the largest library, the most extensive library in the known world, and much has been written about this. And according to the legend, 
the, the head of the library or the king asked, uh, are there any major books that we do not have in our library? And the librarian said, there's only one, and that is the Hebrew scriptures, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the scriptures of the Jewish people. And so they decided to remedy that and they wanted a copy of the Hebrew Scriptures, but translated into Greek. So they, they called 70 rabbis, rabbis who knew the, the Hebrew Scriptures intimately, and asked them if they would translate into Greek. They were reluctant to do so at first because they realized you can't really translate Hebrew into another language and, and still capture its full meaning. It's just impossible. But they decided that if there was a language that could capture much of what is normally lost when we translate Hebrew, they said that the Greek language would be it because it was the most robust at the time. And so they agreed to this and these 70 rabbis came together and they created a translation that were referred to as the Septuagint. Septuagint comes from the Greek word for 70. And you can recognize when something is from the Septuagint because it'll be marked with LXX, which you may recognize as the Roman numeral for 70. So here we have Hebrew scriptures copied into Greek and then Roman numerals used to indicate that this is the Septuagint. Now, all of that to say is when you look at this verse, how the rabbis translated Psalm 22, 25 into Greek, what word did they use to translate kahal? They used the word ekklesia. There it is. So once again, we see that the word for kahal, the word for ekklesia, the word that normally is translated church, are the same word. Let's take one more example. Let's go to the Torah. Let's go to Deuteronomy 4, verse 10. And we'll jump right in. It says, How on the day that you stood before Adonai your God at Horeb, that's at Mount Sinai, Adonai said to me, Gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children so. Now, this is the English Standard Version. And here we see the word kahal used as a verb, gather. It's an it's a order to, to bring together. So there's the word gather. Now, when the, in the Hebrew, you'll see here that we have the word kahal. And this ha kahal, this letter in the front, is what makes it an imperative, it makes it an instruction. This doesn't mean they gather, but just telling him, gather. It's commanding him, gather li et ha'am, gather to me the people. So how does the Septuagint render this verse? Well, you guessed it. There's the word, and I need the right pen. There's the word ecclesias, ecclesia once again. Uh, the Septuagint does make a little change here. Um, it refers to the day of the ecclesia. Instead of making it a gather to me, because ecclesia doesn't work as a verb, it's strictly a noun, uh, the rabbis translated this instead of gather to me. They had to do something with ecclesia, and so they called it the day of the ecclesia, the day of the gathering. But once again, we see that kahal, and ecclesia mean the same thing. Now, one of the things that can be um, kind of interesting is that, again, we only find the word C-H-U-R-C-H in the New Testament scriptures, in the tra English translations, I should say, of the New Testament scriptures. Why don't we find that same word, C-H-U-R-C-H, in translations of the Old Testament scriptures? And the reason for that is that King James, when he commissioned the translation of the King James Bible, uh, uh, and a translation that will finally provide 
a Bible that everyone could read in English. Up to that time, you pretty much had to read the Bible in Latin, unless you knew Hebrew and Greek. He uh, commissioned this translation, and his number one rule was it has to be beautiful English. And the King James Version certainly is beautiful English. We know historically that William Shakespeare uh, took a hand in much of the rendering of the translation to, to make it as beautiful as possible. So, so much of the King James translation, when you read it, you're reading Shakespeare's influence. But there were some negative things that King James also introduced. One of those things is this. He never wanted the word congregation to be used in referring to Christians, to believers in Yeshua coming together. He hated the word congregation. They could use it for other things, but they could never use it when it applied to the Christian people gathering together, the believers in Messiah. And we're going to find uh, a little bit later that the word congregation is found many times in the Hebrew or the Old Testament King James, but it's found only one time in the King James New Testament. And we'll look at that in a moment. But the other rule he made, and this is more sinister, is that he wanted the word church used, C-H-U-R-C-H, he wanted that word used to translate the word ecclesia when it applied to Christians, but he never wanted it to be used anywhere when translating Hebrew words. He wanted it to be used nowhere in the Old Testament, only in the New. And as you can see from what we've already looked at, this is a violation of the translational rules. If the Hebrew word kahal and the Greek word ekklesia mean exactly the same thing, we should be using one English word for both as we go through the scriptures. But King James ruled against that. But I'm showing you this verse here in Acts 7.38 because somewhere along the line, the translators slipped a little bit. In Acts 7, we find Stephen, uh, the first martyr of the Messianic community in the first century, standing up and giving his testimony before the judges. And so he reviews Israel's history. And he says this, This is he that was in the church, in the wilderness, with the angel, which spoke to him, or spake to him in good KJV English, spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. You notice what they did? They actually used the word church to apply it to the Israelites gathered, or I should say the, the great mixed multitude gathered at the foot of Mount Sinai. So when he was thinking about Deuteronomy 4.10, about gathering the people, the kahal, the ecclesia, then when Stephen refers to this event in Acts 7, they actually use the word C-H-U-R-C-H to apply to that event. This is a clue to the fact that the translators knew good and well that the word kahal should be translated the same as the word ecclesia. But their hands were tied. King James is the one who commissioned the translation. He's the king. He's the boss. We follow his rules. But think about the damage that has been done to our understanding. Most believers think the church began in Acts chapter 2 because we don't find the word church anywhere in the Old Testament, unless you read Hebrew. But in our English translations, it's not there. So they think the church is this new thing that begins only in the New Testament scriptures. And so what has happened, a bad translation has had a, a bad impact upon our theology, our understanding, and our clarity when it comes to the Word of God. So let's move on, and we will revisit this as we go. 
The second question I want to ask is this. What is the first occurrence of the Hebrew word for church? I'm going to give you the first three occurrences because they all happen in a very similar context. The first time we find the word kahal, the word that means the same as ekklesia, is clear back in Genesis 28, verse 3. This is when Jacob is preparing to leave his mom and dad because his twin brother Esau has threatened to kill him. And so before he leaves to flee from Esau, he comes to his father Isaac and Isaac blesses Jacob a second time. And he says to Jacob, God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may become a kahal of peoples. Now, what's interesting here is this word for peoples is referring to beyond just the Jewish people, just the direct, uh, direct descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's talking about him being a called together people, a convening of many peoples from all backgrounds. And this is the first appearance, you could say, of the concept of the church way back in Genesis. Many years later, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I almost skipped one here. The second occurrence occurred not too long after the first one. And this is when Jacob is fleeing and he uh, spends the night and um, he has the vision of the ladder that reached from heaven to earth. And God speaks to him and he uses similar wording that his father Isaac did. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful, multiply a nation and a kahal of nations. This is the goyim. These are the Gentiles shall come from you and kings shall come from your own body. This is interesting. He's talking about a kahal of nations will come from you, but then kings will come from your own body. This is referring to something very physical, but this is referring to something more spiritual up here. But now we skip ahead many years. Jacob is on his deathbed, and the third occurrence uh, uh, appears when he is blessing his son Joseph. There in Egypt, uh, Jacob realizes he's about to die, so he calls Joseph to him. And, and while he's blessing Joseph, he recalls the blessings from his own father Isaac and from God. And then this is what he speaks. And he says, And God said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a kahal of peoples, and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting position. So we see here that the first three appearances of this word that should be translated church, if we were consistent, all has to do with Jacob. Not with Abraham, not with Isaac, but with Jacob. Because with Jacob, there comes this, this multiplication of people. And this people, these 70 souls, descended to Egypt, and there they grew into a, a, a nation. For the first time, they're called a nation when they are in Egypt. And then when they come out of Egypt, if you recall, they come out with a great mixed multitude. So there are Gentiles from all backgrounds, slaves who are Egyptian and maybe a Phoenician and Canaanite, who knows what all the backgrounds were. But this great mixed multitude came out with the, with the, the Jewish people and they're just folded into them. They're just folded in. They settle into the tribes of Israel. And afterwards, there's no distinction made. They are just folded in. That's a fulfillment of these three first appearances of Kahal in fulfillment of these prophecies. Question number three. Is Ecclesia always translated church? And the answer is no. I mentioned earlier that there is no religious jargon in the scriptures, yet church is a very religious word. But the word ecclesia is not a religious word. It applies to other things other than just a convening of believers. 
The word ekklesia, as I mentioned, occurs 150 t 115 times in the Greek New Testament, but it is translated church only, and here I have a number of translations for you. It's translated in the King James Version only 80 times as C-H-U-R-C-H. Now, if it occurs 115 times, but they only translate it church 80 times, that means there are 35 times that they don't translate ecclesia as church because it doesn't mean what we think of as the church, as a group of believers. The NIV translates it church 79 times, the New American Standard 77 times, the English Standard Version 74 times. But then we have some of my favorite translations below. The Darby translation is one you may not have heard of. It uh, was done by James Nelson, I'm sorry, John Nelson Darby back in 1867, and he only did the New Testament. And he translated the Greek into English, and then later he translated it into German and then into French. This guy was very gifted when it came to languages. And when Darby made his translation, he wanted to make it as accurate as possible, but he, he says in the preface of his translation that this is not meant for oral reading, for reading in the community and, and in the religious services you may have. He says it's for study, so that the person who lacks the tools to dig into the, the Greek and the Hebrew, lacks the manuscripts, lacks the skills, can do accurate study. And so he does not use the word C-H-U-R-C-H in his translation because it is not an accurate translation of ecclesia. The same is true of the concordant literal translation which is the most hyper-precise and accurate translation that there is. And I plan to talk about it in a separate video when I do a series on, on the various books and uh, book reviews that will be coming up. But it is available to read for free online, Concordant Literal Translation. Just look up Concordant Bible. If you Google it, it will take you to the site and you can read it. So how does it render, render the word ecclesia whenever it's found? All 115 times that the word ecclesia occurs in the New Testament, the CLT translates it ecclesia. In other words, it doesn't try to translate it at all because we really lack a good English word that's an equivalent of kahal and ecclesia. So it leaves the word alone. It does this with a few different Greek and Hebrew words for which we do not have a, an exact English equivalent. And of course, the complete Jewish Bible, as one would expect, you will not find the word C-H-U-R-C-H there either. Now, let's look at how the word ecclesia can be translated because sometimes ecclesia is not referring to a group of believers in Messiah. In fact, I want to show you a place in the book of Acts where it's referring to a mob, a pagan mob at that. In Acts 19, we read about the story of where Paul and, and some of his companions go into a city, and uh, I believe it's Ephesus, and the, the, um, the, the god of Ephesus was Diana. Her biggest temple was located there. And Diana, and, and, and so some of the people there, the silversmiths, made a living. They became very wealthy, making souvenir gods of this goddess, Diana, and selling them. But with Paul's arrival, uh, they lost business, as you can imagine. And there was a big outcry against this. They wanted Paul and his companions dealt with. They wanted them thrown out, put to death, and get rid of these guys or ruining our business. So let's pick it up in verse 28. <clears throat> Acts 19, 28. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Artemis is a, another name for Diana. One of the names is Roman. One of the names is Greek. I forget which. So the city was filled with the confusion. 
and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him in. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the ecclesia was in confusion. Notice they didn't translate this church this time around. This is not referring to a Sunday gathering or a Sabbath gathering of, of Christian believers, of Messianic believers. These are pagans. These are idol worshipers who are in a mob who are angry that their, their idol business is being turned on its head. So some another, for the assembly, the ecclesia was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Now let's skip on down to verse 39. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular ecclesia. Now this is the, the I guess you could call him the mayor who's speaking. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he heard, had said these things, he dismissed the ecclesia. You can imagine the confusion if our translations translated ecclesia as church here. So we see that the word ecclesia is not a religious word. It can refer to a group of people gathering together to worship God and to study his word and to pray but can also refer to an idol-worshipping mob who want to kill Paul and his companions. So, I am going to end this teaching here. I hope I'm leaving you uh, hanging, looking for the next episode, but we will continue and complete our discussion of the word C-H-U-R-C-H in the next episode, and we want to answer these three questions. Are there other Hebrew or Greek words for church? And we'll find that there are. We also want to answer the question, if the church began in Genesis, as we saw, why is its foundation not mentioned until Matthew? And that would be Matthew 16, 18. That might be the verse that's been going through your mind since we started this teaching. And then question number six, did the early Christians go to church? Now that's an interesting question, I think. So, We'll see you next time and invite you back to join us as we talk about the church's most misunderstood word, the church. I'll see you then. Until then, shalom. That's all, folks.